Hello and welcome to another episode of the Offside Musings podcast. My name is O.K. Ndibe, and it's my delight to welcome you um, on behalf of my co-host, Emeka Onyagwa. Uh, the podcast has been a bit uh, inactive, um, again, owing to the fact that uh, I've been on the road and um, specifically to Nigeria. Uh, where I got quite a bit of insight into the mood of the country. And before then, my uh, co-host had been again on a mini move, I I think this time to London, um, where he got uh, a sense of the mood of of Nigerians in the UK. Um, So it's it's a great delight to, uh, to be back. Uh, there's a lot to talk about today, and um, specifically, we're going to be looking at the post-election fallout in Nigeria. I was in the country uh, when the second uh, set of elections, uh, state-wide elections, were held, and so I'm going to be talking a little bit about those. But the main topic has to do with just the sense in Nigeria of absolute, indeed, of grave uncertainty. Already, um, even though he has, um, he's far from taking office. So um, we all know that uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu of the APC was declared the winner of the February 25th, 2023 uh, presidential elections. Uh, great Controversy have uh, has trailed uh, his declaration as a winner, and uh, his pol- major political opponents have gone to court. Uh, so we're going to be talking about some of that, and specifically of the way in which the declaration of Tinubu as a president is already coloring in a very dark way uh, the political environment uh, in Nigeria. Just before we. Uh, began this broadcast, uh, the National Broadcast Commission in Nigeria announced uh, a 5 million naira fine of channels television um, over an interview that the um, television uh, channel um, had with the presidential, vice presidential uh, candidate of the Labour Party, uh, um, Dati um, Baba Ahmed. So we're going to be talking about that, and we're going to be talking about Tinubu's whereabouts, um, about all kinds of other speculations about what's likely uh, to happen uh, in Nigeria going forward. So we're delighted to welcome you uh, to this episode. Okay. A bit, a bit, as you can see, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. All right, all right. All right. So, um, as you know, I was in Nigeria. I spent about 10 days uh, in Nigeria. Um, Half of it was in Lagos, the other half in Anambra State. Uh, and in Anambra State, I was able to um, to witness the uh, elections, uh, statewide elections um, that took place, um, I believe, uh, was it March 15 um, when it happened? Um, give me a quick second. Uh, this was, yes, this was March 15. Um, in my area of the country, I was able to uh, visit uh, Oka and uh, a few other surrounding towns uh, on the day of the election. And the story universally was of a reduced remarkably reduced participation by young people in these elections. 
And um, on the one hand, I thought it was a mistake, um, but it was also understandable. Young men and women had gone out on February 25 to vote in significant numbers in the presidential and national assembly elections. As we now recognize the conduct of those elections, as well as the reporting of those elections, their collation, and ultimately the announcement of the verdict um, has left a lot to be desired. Uh, there is a clear sense in the country as I spoke to uh, people from different parts of the country, uh, from different demographics in the country, from different ethnicities and religions, that clearly a massive fraud has been perpetrated by INEC on the Nigerian people. Um, there is a clear sense that the ruling party's candidate, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, was awarded votes that he did not earn, votes that voters did not give to him, uh, that INEC uh, worked rather hard to undermine its own uh, system, which its leadership had claimed was foolproof uh, against manipulation. Uh, INEC officials, um, and sometimes with a uh, with the um, collaboration of of uh, security ag agents in the country, manipulated the system clearly. And I think that all of that information, or at least some of that information, is going to come out if the Nigerian judiciary is going to be. Um, find a spine to do and to allow a forensic examination of what transpired on February 25. So that's one. Uh, the mood that I found in Nigeria was one of grave uncertainty. There were people who kept saying to me um, that Tinubu would not be sworn in. There is a sense, you know, I, and I don't know where that comes from, but again and again, people will say to you that Tinubu will not be sworn in as president for some reason. Um, and clearly, Tinubu should not be sworn in because he did not win the election. And I think Tinubu himself knows it. I think his people know it, uh, which explains a particular desperation uh, with which uh, they've gone out to ask for the criminalization of free speech, especially free speech that is related to the questionable conduct of the February 25 election. So a few days ago, um, Bayo Nanuga who was a colleague of mine at the Concord newspaper, a, a man that I used to respect, actually, uh, but who has gone way, way, way off the rails, uh, wrote a petition, signed a petition on behalf of Tinubu's campaign, asking that the country's broadcast commission should sanction Channel's television for conducting an interview with uh, the Labour Party's VP candidate, Dati, in which Dati called on the Buhari administration not to inaugurate uh, Tinubu as an uh, president. I don't care what um, anybody thinks, even if somebody thinks that Tinubu won the election leg legitimately. It should be within the free speech rights of a Nigerian to make the statement that that he made. So the fact that Bayo Nanuga should invite the NBC, the regulatory 
body for broadcast media in Nigeria to sanction Channel Television. And that a couple of days later, the MBC would impose a fine of 5 million Naira, citing all kinds of opaque and nebulous violations of what they call broadcast codes in Nigeria should disturb everybody, every Nigerian. Um, it should disturb us because already this is providing some kind of window. Again, a very disturbing window or mirror into the shape of a Tinubu presidency. If Tinubu is going to uh, pre his inauguration, begin to dictate the silencing, the censorship of media over speech that he finds uncomfortable, then we should be chilled by the prospect of what Tinubu is going to do to speech when he becomes president and has what you might describe as wide, if not plenary, powers. It's um, Tinubu is a man who particularly invites questioning. Okay. Um, as we have said in a bunch of episodes of this podcast, Tinubu is a man whose name nobody can vouch for, whose educational credentials nobody can vouch for, whose age nobody can vouch for, whose antecedents, broadly speaking, nobody can vouch for, whose history in crime would indeed invite and demand scrutiny. And so if he's going to shut down discussions, even before being sworn in as president, I think Nigerians should be truly, truly um, worried about this. So I'm going to pause. And I know that uh, you've been thinking about some of these matters. And uh, so I'll have you weigh in. On the contrary. Um, <laughs> I try not to think about <laughs> On the absolute contrary, I try not to think about these matters because... Um, I don't feel the, the the I don't feel there are any good solutions. Put it this way: I, we always um, every year, if you live in America, they would say every election is an existential threat. Which actually, I, I used to think they were they were hyperbolic, put it like that. But I, over time, I've come to accept that. Those people are not being hyperbolic, even though some people are using it in in in, in a hyperbolic mood. Election uh, uh, democracy is the most fragile form of government, and the Nigerian um, quote unquote democracy is literally non-existent. It, in all fairness, had never existed, and. For me, I, I accepted that reality back at, towards the end of Abbas Just tenure that a fourth republic uh, of this so-called fourth republic uh, named fourth republic of Nigeria. This is in essence the fourth time the space called Nigeria is organizing democracy or some form of it. And as Thomas Sowell would say, a lot of these African countries. Nigeria especially, have experimented on how far can you go with taking some other person's structure and trying to implement it in your own space. Nigeria tried that first with the British structure. It didn't work. They went on and created the American structure, literally creating their own state. It's been an absolute disaster. And it's, it continues to produce, it, con it continues to outdo itself. It continues. If you think things are bad and you're complaining, mm, <laughs> wait till the next iteration of, 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 you know, so Tinubu is coming. 
for those of us that grew up in Lagos and came of age in terms of voting age in Lagos during Tinubu's time. There are a lot of things we don't, I don't necessarily say because people, people would have doubted me or assumed that there were some material motives, but uh, it's good that some of these things are being displayed for the national stage and maybe the international stage and people are seeing, just like you said, people who you felt, who you had, who you felt, who you looked at in a certain way and they are being exposed for what they are, to paraphrase you. Right? I'll, I'll put it that way, but you put it differently. So, you know, I, it is... It is, and it is a very disturbing saga episode. Um, now and they're suppressing voices, and you know we we talked about it. We're supposed to have some people on the show that will talk about it in terms of how NSAS was the young people, and Nigeria is a very young population. We're talking about seventy five percent of the population, somewhere around that, under thirty years old, um, somewhere around that. And under 40, you're talking of over 80% of the population frustrated, locked out of any kind of economic process, progress. Jackma has now become an official term, meaning people, the middle class and the intellectual young people are, are now just openly leaving the country. The irony is, I know I always, uh, when people say I always sound, I always, I, I seem cynical, I, you know, but the reality is, that's how a lot of people have been, have ended up in countries like America and the UK over the last 20, 30 years. When my father came to America, nobody even wanted to come to America then from Nigeria. You were the failures, what the failures went to America. You wanted to be either in the UK or in Nigeria back in the day. Uh, and now it's gone. It's, to the place where people are willing to go to Vietnam, Laos, places that have been, they, they, they themselves had be, have been brutalized in actual deadly wars. I'm using Vietnam as an example, but there are a whole bunch of places. These places have been brutalized in actual deadly wars. If you go and look at the Vietnam War, which is which happened overlapping the Nigerian Civil War and ended long after the Nigerian Civil War. That was a much brutal, more brutal conflict. And I'm not trying to measure pain, but it is just the truth. But they have become a country where people are willing to enter into, into a ship and run, run away from countries like Nigeria to get there. To me, that says a lot. Um, so many examples, Dubai, Singapore, and you look at Nigeria just continuously producing these episodes. And now it's the iteration of Tinubu who, I mean, there's, if you have been anybody being objective, you didn't even vote for him. He didn't win. If you want to play <clears throat> sleight of hands with this stuff, that's fine. I think the system is bad. doesn't matter who will have come out, but Tinubu didn't win. And the youths, had like literally he probably lost the youth vote by at least 70 percent at least mm -hmm. i would say probably more because i would say so with the four major candidates i would say kwan kwaso got a lot of the youth votes as well a lot of the people in kano and katsina voted for him there were some other candidates that were not even on the labor party that people actually supported like shay mark in of oil but he he went in and did everything to get these votes. And I hear all these false equivalencies. I'm not even interested. Oh, everybody read. And these guys, this is, this is all false equivalency. This is, this is, this is what happened. Uh, and it's so sad because yeah. when I was in London, I was talking with a bunch of my friends who I've known for a long time, who were uh, to some level involved in the cap, in Tilbu's campaign. And they were telling me things that, the strategies that they were that were, was going to play out, uh, you know, and a lot of what they said played out. <laughs> I was just, I'm, <laughs> you know, they said played out. Like, I'm like, well, like, why are you guys? So, I like, look, okay, we don't care. We just want to grab the power, and then we are going to go back to Nigeria and 
get a position and then still come back to London and be working in a, you know, essentially working in two places, if that is possible, only in Nigeria. So, you know, that's, 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 that's like, for me, it's just, it's, 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 it's sitting down, sitting back. I, I find it, I understand why people are saying Tinubu will not be inaugurated. Whether you like it or not, it is, it, it is tearing, the, it is exposing the fault lines and in a way tearing the country apart, which the country was never together. So it's kind of weird to mm-hmm. even say tear the mm-hmm. country apart. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, let's, let's say it's, it's showing that the country's foundations are non existent. Mm. It's, it's, it's pulling people, even in families. I have people in families fighting with their, their mm. family members. Mm-hmm. Like why is, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's, and it's young people want a better country because everybody can leave. The older people are stuck with this very toxic, well, not all of them, but a lot of them are stuck with this toxic, horrible ideas that they have, and they are still trying to force it down people's throats in every way, shape, or form. It's exposed a lot of things. You see, Kiyama, for instance, who is supposed to be a, one of the brightest legal minds <laughs> in Nigeria. <laughs> I'm like, if this is one of the brightest legal minds in Nigeria, I would rather call my... Um, I'll call, I'll go and talk to my two year old twins. I think they probably are better legal theorists than this guy. <laughs> because it's ridiculous, man. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, you can take it from there, but you mm-hmm. know. It's just well, you know, yeah, so so here I was um I I happened to be in Nigeria when Bayo Nanuga uh wrote his incendiary uh comment on, on Twitter. And talk about impeachable, uh, violent, thoughtless, incendiary speech. Uh, I think that Bayo Nanuga for the next decade is going to carry the prize. Uh, between him and uh, Femi Fanikayo Day, I think that they have dredged the bottom of the barrel in absolute thoughtlessness in in the um, most unconscionable trading in ethnic baiting, um, that Bayo Nanuga, um, and I, I, I have to admit that when I read where Bayo Nanuga said, basically issued a warning to Igbo people, quote unquote, never to interfere in Lagos politics. And he says they should not try it in 2027. And he said that Lagos was not no man's land, that Lagos was like any other state, Anambra, and he named a few other ones. It, when I read it, I immediately went and wrote a response to him because this is somebody who was my colleague at the Concord newspaper years ago, okay? Was a reporter, I was on the editorial board of the Concord. Um, And somebody who went ahead to found a fairly respected news organization, The News, with somebody that I consider uh, a brother, uh, Kunle Ajibade. And for a brief period of time, I actually wrote a column for the news uh, magazine. So when I read this um, rather uncouth and ignorant driver by by Ananuga, it it affected me on the body in a in a way that very few things had affected me i was shaking with rage and my first instinct was to call him but it turned out that where i had his number was a, a phone that i had lost so i no longer had his number uh i ended up settling for calling uh his former colleague uh kunle ajibade and i had a very uh good conversation with kunle ajibade 
Now, people like Bayo Nanuga, again, who betrayed everything that uh, he knows, because it, it has to be will, willful um, betrayal of every principle that you know. Bayo Nanuga forgot that Nigeria is a nation and that no Nigerian is a stranger in any part of Nigeria. Okay? Uh, Bayo Nanuga forgot that uh, it takes only one vote to establish a majority in an election. So even if there are not uh, Yoruba people in the same number as you find Igbo people in Lagos, say Yoruba people in Enugu, the same number as you find Igbo people in Lagos, that theoretically there could be a, a, a situation where there's an election in Enugu state and the two candidates score exactly the same number of votes and one vote voter who could be Yoruba would decide who then takes a post. You don't invalidate that situation by saying, oh, it's a Yoruba person, he should not have interfered, right? The citizens, when they vote in their country, wherever they are, whether you are a Yoruba person in Nasarawa uh, or an Alsa person in, in Imo, you are not interfering. You are exercising your rights and the privileges of citizenship when you vote anywhere in the, in the, in the world. That Igbo people who are in Lagos, just like people from Akwaibom, people from uh, different parts of the country, from the northern part of the country and so on, that they pay taxes in Lagos. They don't just take from Lagos. They contribute to the growth of the, of the state and of the city. They contribute their talents and their resources and so on. And so they've earned the right to vote. They do not interfere. Okay, but I think that there was something even more dangerous, a more dangerous game which Bayo Nanuga was playing. Bayo Nanuga knew, must know, that Tinubu lost Lagos by a much wider margin than Einek uh, declared. Okay, it was read in order to make it a close race, uh, seem like a close race, that P2B of the Labour Party beat. Uh, uh, Bola Metinubu by a decisive majority, okay, in Lagos. At least 40 points. And, and it wasn't because of Igbo people. It was because Yoruba young people, northern young people from different parts of the country, from different minority groups, from, of course, Igbo people. But it was across the board, across the ethnic board, and across class lines, but especially young people had rejected Bola Tinubu, and for good reason, because Bola Tinubu has been a parasite in Lagos. This man has brought one of the most um, insatiable, most unscrupulous appetites to the gorging of the resources of Lagos State, okay? And of much of the Southwest, by the way. And there are Yoruba people who wanted that to stop, okay? So Bayo Nanuga knew that it was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-class, multi-clan coalition that decimated Tinubu in Lagos and elsewhere in, in the country. But he wanted to give the impression that Tinubu's political wars or the challenge to the incumbent governor of Lagos State, the challenge to his reign as Tinubu's hand-picked um, governor, he wanted to give the impression that it was solely Igbo so to divide this significant and majestic coalition, to divide them in our to rule. So um, 
that level of unprincipled um, service to the darkest political agenda um, has there's not no amount of money that anybody should 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 receive in order to as it were tarnish his name as Bayo Ananuga has done. I think that Bayo Ananuga is going to live out the rest of his lives, bearing the, the rest of his years, bearing um, a public act of contrition, of uh, a public apology to Nigerians, um, uh, bearing that Bayo Ananuga is going to really, I don't care how much money he gets, because one thing that a lot of us forget, a lot of Nigerians forget, is that in at the very end, at the very end, uh, you get you can be mocked by the illicit riches that you receive from, from politicians. You can be mocked because if you receive uh, uh, filthy money from politicians in order to serve their um, their evil agenda, <laughs> ultimately you will be overrun and overwhelmed by that evil. So it's not just the other people who are against the politician, it's you, okay? And so there is something that has been happening over the last couple of days on social media, especially on Twitter, that I like to address. So yes, somebody went and dug up uh, a no, column. Um, columns. Yeah, a column I wrote about Peter Obi, I think in 2011. Yes, I did write a column. I was critical of, of Peter Obi for refusing uh, in that election where he wasn't a candidate, but he was supporting one of the uh, candidates for failing to focus on the issues, but uh, focusing rather on somebody's height and uh, and some other inconsequential factors, including the ethnic affiliations of his, of his political opponent. And I properly rebuked Peter B for that stance. Now, so people have brought it up. Okay, and some of them are suggesting, oh, Ken Debay um, is 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 a hypocrite because he knew that Obi had done this, and today Ken Debay is supporting Obi. First of all, what I do uh, is not to support one candidate or another. I do analysis, and what I have said consistently was that Peter Obi was running, and which is an incontrovertible fact that Peter Obi ran. The most focused, the most focused, most intellectually vibrant campaign, which is why ultimately young people, you know, um, cottoned up to him and adopted him as their vessel, if you like, as a vessel for the realization of their dreams to reshape Nigerian politics. That's what happened. So Peter Obi was doing in this election what I thought he should have done in 2011, which was to focus on issues. So if Peter Obi focused on issues this time around, I would not be dredging up what he did in the past, where he made uh, a different kind of choice. And this is true of all politicians. When Bill Clinton took over as president of America, he moved fast to do healthcare reform and he put his wife in charge, right? Mm -hmm. And the political opposition felt that his wife was moving uh, too speedily to create what they call, call socialized medicine. So they felt that Bill Clinton was taking the US in, uh, in the a leftist direction that he did not have a mandate to go. Bill Clinton was chastened because of electoral reverses in midterm elections. And what did he do? He moved himself squarely to the middle, okay? And when he came to the middle, 
a lot of his political critics recognized that he was where they wanted him to be in the middle. So the fact that Obi had done something bad in the past, which I wrote about, which I do not deny, I do not retreat from, does not mean that when Peter Obi was doing the writing and focusing on politics and saying to people, don't vote for me because I'm evil, but vote for me if you consider my programs to be the best. I thought that that was by far the best campaign, okay, of, of the major candidates. So the other thing is that Tinubu, apart from saying a miloko, it's my turn, had absolutely no way of establishing a vision for Nigeria. Tinubu would not participate in, an, in, in any debate. Tinubu did not do any televised interviews to speak of. Tinubu absolutely refused at Chatham House to even answer questions. He couldn't. Okay. And there's a man, let's face it, in profound physical, mental, and psychological decline. There's no question. So anybody who is celebrating that a man they would not put in charge of their personal affairs if they had a choice would now be running a complex organism called a country, Nigeria. I want those people to know that if you are celebrating Tinubu because you have this narrow vision that is Yoruba and you are Yoruba, when you go to the market, you are not going to say, I voted for Tinubu and get food stuff for free. If there is food shortage in the country or there is no health care to speak of, you are not going to go to a hospital and say, hey, I'm a Tinubu supporter and somehow get sound health care. All of us, all of us ultimately will suffer when we continue to choose terrible leaders just because those, re those leaders sort of speak to our ethnic, lazy ethnic or religious or other parochial uh, interests. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even know. I don't know where to, with these, I don't know where to even start from with guys like this. And there are so many of them the prominent ones. Mm -hmm. There are so many of them inciting mm -hmm. these guys. There are so many of them bringing up false stories, false equivalencies. It's just, and it's, it's the funniest thing is um, you would think it's just people in Nigeria. Nope. It's a lot of them that live overseas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A especially, lot of these people actually, are, especially, yeah. driven, yeah, driven by mm -hmm. them. So you would be like, oh, it's, it's you no, know, these are people that have lived overseas for a long time. Let me find Ikayade. His father was the same uh, Fanny Power that had uh, issues with uh, Wallowa back in the day, right? So let me find Ikayade went to school in, in England and finished his um, A levels and secondary school there and law school and all that. And he, the attack. I I I I gotta make this point. It's just so funny. I just I, I didn't want to, but I gotta make this point. You attack somebody because you start attacking his uh, lineage. His father is his father is Yoruba. Mother is Igbo. You start saying somebody. You actually say somebody like that cannot be governor of Lagos. This is the same man that has a number of children from a number of places, and all his <laughs> sons are all. From Ibo. <laughs> so it's like, what are you saying, Oga? <laughs> You're well, saying your sure. own sons not, are not we're, Ibo. We're, we're not sure, by the way, that all his all his children are Ibo. No, all his um, sons. All his boys. All his sons. Okay. Uh, uh, from, from everything we all know about, every son, he's saying, he said somebody born of an Ibo mother mm -hmm. cannot be a Yoruba person. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. from everything we know about, Every son he has <laughs> is some Anibo woman. So it, it just shows you how bizarre some of these people are. It's like, what's... 
you see, he says stuff like, you know, politics is for the big boys. It's not for poor people. Or you know, yeah. it, it, it's like, what are you taking, man? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. What, what, not, this not, is... not not to not to interrupt you, but it's 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 like the same thing that Bayo Nanuga did, right? Here was Bayo Nanuga uh, a few years ago in Kigali, and he went to the genocide museum. And it comes out and it writes a post, which is informed, which is high-minded, which is principled. And it points to the pitfalls of playing ethnic, ethno-sectarian politics, okay? And the genocide that that uh, can produce. Then in the heat of a political conflict, the same Bayonanuga immediately reaches for the same kind of rhetoric, the same kind of othering of, of people from a major ethnic group, you know, and basically part of what I found frightening is that I see the bio nanugas of our world raising machetes and cudgels against their friends who happen to be Igbo. And so I was very fortunate. I was invited actually to introduce Willa Shoenka at the launch of his book of poetry, okay, on March 21st, which was World Poetry Day. And I told the story of what Shoenka had done for me as, as a young writer, how Shoenka had championed my work in very profound and very generous ways. And I told people, I said, Shoinka did not mistake me for a Yoruba. He knew I was Igbo. But unlike Bayo Nanuga, who said that his first identity was Yoruba, Shoinka recognizes that his first identity is human and that his religious, his ethnic uh, identity is an accident, ultimately. And that is true for all of us. Okay? What makes us who we are should be irreducibly our human identity so that the whole idea, and you see the absurdity also of this ethnic profiling, that there were Yoruba people who came out to vote in Lagos and they were sent away. They were told, you look Igbo. We don't want you to vote. Yep. Okay. Um, and we should remember, I have a student who is from Rwanda in my class. And recently we were, we were talking in class about the fact that during the genocide in Rwanda, some men who were Hutu killed their mother, their mothers who were Tutsi, because they believed that Tutsi people were evil. And so these men did not recognize that they themselves were half Tutsi. They killed their own mothers. Oof. And so once we go down that line, and that's why what Bayonanoga did is for me unforgivable. That at some point, unless this guy comes out and says, I really misspoke, rather than what he did, which is to dig in. If Bayonanoga does not come out and say, I misspoke, the Igbo are welcome as full citizens of Nigeria to vote wherever they live unless he recognizes, because it's not a mistake, Bayonanuga knows better, unless he recognizes that he did something particularly and profoundly evil, I think that his humanity for me is discounted. Yeah. I'm afraid. I, I, there are just so many angles to I give stories on this from different angles. It just makes me laugh. Um, we could sit down and I could sit down and talk about the the reality of even the Lagos itself, it's literally an economic um, creation. If the country was structured properly, mm -hmm. Lagos wouldn't be. Um, yeah. And I, I get what people are saying. I think if you, oh, you know, like, look, look, certain things have certain ingredients to make certain places great. I'm not, I don't even... I, in fact, it's not even, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost like going there to give a soliloquy on how 
how places end up. It ends up, you know, it, and it's not, it's not about accepting anybody or not accepting, you know, it's, it's all about what direction do you want to go into? Are you, are you a state? If you're a state, structure your state uh, in a way everybody understands the rules, right? Let's structure it. Let's say, hey, man, if you're not ethnically in the rules, and that's fine, and everybody accepts and sits down and says, this is, this, this is how we are mm-hmm. as a state, as a nation. Well, we're not mm-hmm. a nation, we're a state. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying Lagos in particular. I'm talking about Nigeria as a state now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or you sit down and you say, hey, this stuff is not working. Mm-hmm. What can we do to either A, make it better, or B, go our own ways in the best way possible? Mm-hmm. Uh, because this this is not working. Mm-hmm. Anybody, yeah, <laughs> this is this is not working. Um, mm-hmm. I just sit down when people talk about it. I'm like, look, you understand? Mm-hmm. I don't want to go into the composition because people will be like, yeah, you know, if so so and so leave, so so and so can do the job, bros. Mm-hmm. That's not. I'm not. I'm not telling you. That's not the secret sauce to mm-hmm. what makes a place. Mm-hmm. It, 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 history shows it over and over again. Um, what makes places. I'm not telling you, I'm just telling you, look, if you want to live in a certain way, then live in a certain way. It's better. It doesn't matter how you end up. You don't, you want to exist and you feel what you need to hold on to is a certain homogeneity, right? You want to be homogeneous in your mind. So you, you propose that, you go after that. And if your level of homogeneity needs to have either its own state or something, then that's what you should pursue. You don't need to you don't need to other other people and start acting like I know Charlie uh as Igbos, Igbos are part of the framed middleman minority um formed by two so, um, sociologists. You know, middlemen minorities, talking of um, Armenians, talking of um uh, Indians in certain places, Pakistanis in certain places, Jews in certain places. So the key about middlemen minorities is that they don't we don't always have to uh, um, it's well defined. We don't always have to own something. We do. We, we're able to slide into certain places like ac- academia, writing, uh, trading, these kind of things that look super simple, uh, super easy, but it's not easy. People always tend to, and you see with people, 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 the most um, um, profound example that people that lays on people's minds is it's Germany and what became Nazi Germany and. And you know the writings of 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 the writings and the distance of of um, Wagner and all these guys that they, that was turned into something. Ubermensch, the Ubermensch, the Superman. Uh, in, anyway, let me not go into the philosophy. But yeah, the, people people don't understand how what Germany was prior to what it went through. You see Germany still has a big country. Oh, Germany is big, all that. Germany went through a whole bunch of wars and all that, but Germany largely has always powered, largely almost entirely powered Europe for the longest time. Parts of, not Germany as a country, but those parts have powered, uh, uh, Germanic tribes have powered Europe, Europe, um, Europe's intellectualism for a long time. Yes, you, not only you don't have this thing, but if you look at, surely the Enlightenment period, a lot of the problem again, there are guys like Hume, Scottish, there are guys like Rousseau, who is French. I'm not, I know some people just wake up and be like, now there are guys who, but Germany itself, in terms of the arts, the music, a lot of what Germany stood for, it, 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 it never got back, got it back. I saw it with so many countries, so many places. We don't talk about the Ottoman Turks. What happened? Same thing, expelled. They did all this ordering and, you know, same thing with Portugal. They ended up in the backwaters by doing the same thing. In fact, that's how Constantinople fell as well. The point is that it, if you, those who, the point I'm trying to make in a very complex way is that those who make peaceful change impossible, make violent change inevitable. And a lot yeah. of the time, it also affects, it's going to affect your generations as well you are mm-hmm. not going to be you're not going to be almost certainly history is the history history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes mm-hmm. all the time you're mm-hmm. not going to be what you think you are and that's the irony of it you're mm-hmm. not going mm-hmm. new york california these places boston that the big economic centers in in america what do they have in common they have, they've always attracted middlemen minorities right 
doesn't matter how you want to create a Dubai. That's why Dubai now is trying to not they've normalized relationships with places like Israel. Again, all I'm t- I, it's it's kind of like convoluted way of just saying, look, you need to, people need to sit down and decide what they want to do. Doesn't matter. Just yeah. decide what you want to do. If you want yeah. people in the country, you know, but but this is not work. You can't yeah. you can't wake up in places um, places like in Cano, you can't, you know, you either a state or you're not a state. And if you're a state, what are the rules in this state? Precisely. And, Let's know. And, and we, we have we have often said that <clears throat> if you look at Nigeria's two major writers, Wole Shoyinka and Cheno Achebe, they always said, Achebe said that the Nigerian nation had not been founded. Shoyinka famously at a lecture in Harvard uh, which became part of his um, book, The Open Soul of a Continent, uh, said that there was no nation in the space called Nigeria. So it's a space. It's called a country, but there's no nation in it. In it. There's no national consciousness that, that animates that space. Okay? And ultimately, we either have to find a way of changing that or find a way of dissolving the pretense that we have a, a nation, okay? Um, what happened in in the recent elections makes the best argument ultimately. As you know, I've, I've never been a fan of Biafra. I've always been a fan of the prospect. Nigeria hasn't done much for itself or for its citizens. But I think that properly harnessed and husbanded that the Nigerian collectivity can actually achieve uh, something of, of profound significance, that we have enough talent, we have enough resources to make an interesting uh, people, to weave an interesting people out of the space called Nigeria. Now, but a nation, as Wole Shoyinka said in his prison memoir, that justice is the first condition of humanity. You cannot continue to have a country where injustice reigns. So the the Tinubu camp used this whole red herring of the Igbo threat in order to impose injustice in Lagos. So a lot of people were... um, were disenfranchised, uh, disenfranchised. Um, people were intimidated, people were beaten up, maimed, killed, um, just to enforce uh, that a particular uh, crime family may continue to thrive, both within Lagos and without Lagos, okay? So, Ultimately, you are doing an injustice uh, to everybody, including to Yoruba people. Uh, but you sort of frame it as there's an Igbo threat. Igbo people are coming to take over your land. Uh, before you know it, there will be an Igbo governor in Lagos. I said this would be the worst possible thing. It reminds me of America, where some people felt that the election of Obama somehow tainted America in a fundamental way and that this had to be corrected, you know, um, by ensuring that not only did it not happen, but that we create a sense of uh, the renaissance, the rising of this violated American spirit, which is ultimately white, um, you know, white and, um, and racist, you know. So, we have to we have to determine that we if we want to st- stay together as a country uh if we don't want to stay together as a country that's good i think that all nigerians can survive on their own ultimately if it came to that yep. to one degree or another mm-hmm. but if we're going to stay together we must decide the rules of engagement we must decide the irreducible what it means so that thing that Hunts people. I mean, there was a, a northern mayor in Enugu pre the Civil War. Okay, 
it's what we have now is a retreat, a sad, tragic retreat from the progress that we were making when at one point Zeke was going to control the Western region. Okay. There was a retreat from that promise. Awo could have come to the, the Eastern region and created a coalition of, you know, uh, action group progressives and held power there. That would have been the way that a country uh, proceeds, right? So we have not achieved that. We have actually retreated so far into a very dark place. So, which is why people are saying that given the kind of fraud, the kind of violence, the kind of falsehood, the kind of of um, the kind of egregious impunity that brought that got Tinubu uh, announced as a, as elected president in an election which I'm sure that he and his cohort know that they did not win. Mm -hmm. That perhaps at best he came second, if that. Okay, so. Given all of that, if Tinubu comes to power, so I don't know what's going to happen. My hope is that the courts grow a spine and ask INEC to do the right thing, either to announce the right winner or in some places to redo the election. But I have no doubt now, and again, before the election, I have to credit you for being a prophetic voice. I did not expect Peter B to do as well as he did, mm -hmm. you were sure that he was going to win the elections. Mm -hmm. I thought that he was going to shake up the system with mm -hmm. the, the energy of the youth and draw the attention of the system, right? So if OB had come second or even third, in a free, credible election, I would have said, okay, mm -hmm. this is good for everybody because the system would know that unless those who hold power would know that unless they really turn around and begin to serve the interests of the Nigerian people that perhaps the next election there will be an OB or somebody like him who is going to mobilize the young people and win then. I didn't expect it to happen this time around. But from every intelligence that I've got, OB won that election by, That's right. by, so outright. That's right. You see, I have no question about that now. Okay. And, and, and I'm shocked. My suspicion is that perhaps OB himself was shocked. But that tells you the depth of impatience that people have. And as you said, something very profound, that when you prevent peaceful change, you make violent change inevitable. Okay. So the young people in NSAS try to take back their country, to reshape their country. Peacefully. They, peacefully. They were shot. Okay. They came they to protest. Were, they will cook. They, came, they will clean they, up after themselves. Precisely, they will go precisely. on their own. They gave, they gave us a vision of, of the country. There was, that was there was no tribalism. No. And then after the NSAS thing, they started injecting this nonsense tribalism. Yes. Yes. Started, precisely. Right? So and it's the came, same thing they've done here again. Yes, and the kids disavowed all of that, and they came together, stood behind one of the political candidates, who in some ways did not earn it. The young and and I sort of like the logic of the young people. They said it's not about to be it's us. Mm -hmm. We have chosen him; he has not chosen us. Okay, so which is why you and I said in one of the episodes of our podcast that if we be found a way to win that it will be due to the youth. And I said that the youth must insist on being in a room of power. They must insist on being part of the government because if they left it up to OB, the passengers of our world and other traditional politicians will fill the space. And before you know it, the dreams of the youth will be put to one side. So now the youth have come out in an election they voted and they have seen this old rear guard geriatric, wounded, mindless, senseless, insensible men uh, uh, of power say to them, we're going to shamelessly steal your dreams and continue to 
reshape this country or to shape this country in a way that that impoverishes you and the vast majority of Nigerians. I I can't predict how the youth are going to respond if on May 29th, Tinubu is inaugurated president. <laughs> I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised if, if the country, you know, is set on fire. You know, we forget, we forget, <laughs> we forget how conflicts start. They typically, if you go back and take a look, they start with elections. Mm-hmm. The, the election is the ball not start. How how the final igniting match mm-hmm. conflicts mm-hmm. elections? Mm-hmm. It's typically the final election. Uh, if if that if the, the, that space has it within it, it's typically some election mm-hmm. that starts the whole that end that puts in that match somewhere. Whichever conflict you want to go into, whether it's Vietnam, I mentioned earlier, or uh, American Civil War. I mean, if you look at um, what's happening in Ukraine, you know, Ukraine, in 2014, Ukraine, every, with the election, for, yep. and then the coup, and then and Russia America goes removed, in and takes Crimea, uh, and, you know. America was the one that went and removed. People forget. America was part of uh, unseating the Ukrainian system, but that's neither here nor there. But it's typically it's typically the final accelerator. Is some election happens, and people it, it goes it 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 goes in different ways. Whether it's the Weimar Republic, whether it's Weimar, well, whether you know the Weimar comes in and all that in Germany, or whether it's the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, Vietnam, or the French Revolution. It's typically the French Revolution. People forget that they. The final annoyance with um, um, King Louis the Sixteenth was um, switching um, prime. Wait, I'm not even going to that point. Is made even the also switching either the elections or changing power in a certain way. If there's no actual direct elections, it's typically the um, it's typically the okute that, that pushes people into like okay. Okay, and I, I am somebody who will say I always say, and I, I am, I am consistent with it. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you the, the end, the end. But I, I don't say it, and I, hundred percent believe in this. You are free to annoy people. You're very free, but you're not, you're not free to tell them how to react. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're free. Mm-hmm. I know people will say, oh, you know, and I'm. I'm not that guy that says, well, you know, oh, you should, Mm-mm. not me, not me. You're free to annoy people. Mm-hmm. You're not free to say, hey, if this is me, oh, maybe I'm a weaker person. Oh, you know, you're a big guy, I can annoy you. No, you're a smaller person, you're annoying a big person, and the big person smolds you like a ball of Gary or swallow and throws you out, and you start saying, well, I'm small now. No, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh-uh. When you clearly know, you clearly can see, or you choose not to see, that people are, are are trying to do things in a certain way. Nigeria has a large population. We don't know what the number is. They're coming up with this census again. I don't even, please don't do it. Don't, just don't, don't. It's enough. Whoever is, just let let the census be. It's a large population. There are a lot of young people. People are frustrated. Not everybody can jack. But a lot of people have been leaving. Have my generation have finished secondary school in the very late 90s, early 2000s. A lot of us were straight out the door already. A lot of us didn't want to come back. And you go back and you see a lot of your classmates. And imagine I make, I, I look, I was posting in one of the groups, one of my my distinct groups, and, and the guy there is a politician and telling people like, yeah, they told him to wait his turn. Wait his turn for, I need all due respect, I'll say, wait his turn for uh, maybe a, a House of Assembly seat. In Lagos State House of Assembly seats, or wait your turn for what what might it be. you won't even probably get federal reps. But let's say you get a federal representative mm-hmm. seat at his age, you know he's in his early forties. We're talking about it. The first minister in Scotland that they also looked at is thirty-seven. Mm-hmm. You have a lot yeah. of young leaders who are thirty-four. 
the Prime Minister of England of of Great Britain right now, Rishi Sunak, is forty two. Uh, <laughs> the guy that is trying to take over and, and get the Republican nomination in in, in this country is forty four. As Ron DeSantis, right? He's mm-hmm. 40. Yes, America has old politicians, but they have a lot of young politicians too. Mm-hmm. So you have people all around the globe playing prominent roles, but not only, like you said, like we, we talked about in the previous episode about Saraki, the way Saraki addressed the youths. Not only are you trying to condescend to the youths of the mm-hmm. country, you're trying to turn them. You're trying to turn them into into. As if they are they are insane. You don't. You don't mm-hmm. they're, they're suppressing their voices. They're condescending yeah. to them. You're you're making them. And some of them are buying it because well, from, some of them are buying it. Yeah, Which from is... the elections, from the presidential to the distant elections, mm-hmm. I saw a lot of people who I felt were um, were like, well, I'll vote for B, you know. But you can see I had friends who I talked to for hours on the phone, and you could see like, okay, this guy was raised in a tribalistic. Because the majority of Nigerians, I'd say, close to fifty percent or somewhere around that, have a very, a very tribalistic and negative sense of it, right? So you can say, "Oh, I vote for B," kind of thing. But from there to the distance, it's like, "Oh no, um, this guy doesn't have um, uh, experience." Does mm-hmm. bro? You're not fooling yeah. anybody, man. You ain't fooling anybody. Okay, it's not about ex- you. You can clearly see it. your problem is you. People wanted to nitpick. And their nitpicking is because they are driven purely by mm-hmm. ethnic considerations. It doesn't, yeah. you're dividing the country, you're dividing people, you're turning. Imagine somebody who has four sons and a number of girls from multiple women, like a deadbeat, deadbeat dad, actually, funny enough. And all your sons are from Igbo women. But you're coming out to say, and a, an Igbo father and a, a, a an Igbo mother and a, a Yoruba father is not a Yoruba person. Are you okay? <laughs> like, what are you talking about, man? Like, what? what and, uh, it's like, why does this even matter? Like, you come in and, and it's like, how much is this money that mm-hmm. you really want? Because there's no other thing that's driving this. The Lord, how much? How much? How much is this? Mm-hmm. What? What do you stand to profit? At least. Uh, you read some of these guys in history that wanted to be homogeneous. You read even Hitler, right? That wanted to be homogeneous and the Third Reich. Uh, at least they believed in some cookie ass, um, what would I call it? Racial whatever that they believed in. You don't even, you, you just believe in hate. You don't really even believe in anything. No, 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 no. Uh, I don't think. Um... I don't think Femi Fanica that believes in. Well, not even Femi, some of the other guys. Fanica just okay, believes in okay, money. Okay. Oh, precisely. Money. That's what I was going to say. In so, Femi Fanica is that very weird and strange uh, being who brings himself out and says, if you pay me enough, I can say anything you want me to say. And I can yep. say it with seeming eloquence. Okay. So, so that's his game. That's his brand. Um, that uh, I can, he is Femi, Femi Fanny Kayade is capable of saying one thing today with dredging up some passion. And then tomorrow, a different master pays him and he will say the direct opposite, something that is directly uh, contradicts what he said yesterday. And he says it with, with, equal passion, <laughs> you know, and, and so on. So, so you know, so people like that, if Nigeria were a better space in terms of socioeconomic conditions, people like Femi Fanica, there would be interesting species of some kind of political tragic comedy. So, so that, you know, when you want to have a laugh, you know, you know how Patrick of, of, of Bihabwa, you know, wow, does, wow, wow, wow. Bihabwa, you know, spews this um, highfalutin, bombastic oh, language. Oh, that, yeah, that's you what go it is. Google Patrick. <laughs> you know, if you want to laugh, right? Yes. Go Google you know, Patrick. Yeah, yeah, he will, yeah, he will, you know, he will so, make you laugh. Yeah. So, Kevin <laughs> Panikayo, there will be. Uh, you know, in that sort of class where people will say, okay, 
let's go and see where Femi Fanica they said that A was true and B was false today. And then the next day he says B is true and A, <laughs> A is false. You know, and, and he says both things which are mutually, uh, you know, exclusive. Uh, it says both things with with equal. Okay. It's like know, he, 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 he sits yeah. down and he, he, will, he will convince. He, he, <laughs> you look at this guy. This guy is, this guy is convinced of what he's yes, saying. Like, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, the yes, next yes. day he will come out but, and but, say, but yeah, yeah. Like, have, <laughs> there's no conviction. As he's speaking, he's, remind, he's remembering how much money he's been paid to to do this performance. You know, and and you know, it's, it's like. And that's a guy it, that was it, a, a minister multiple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some ways, it's, 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 it's like somebody, a prostitute that you pay to tell you, you know, uh, she loves you. The next day, somebody <laughs> pays her and she says, I love you to that person who <laughs> pays her that day, you know. Um, or in the uh, language uh, of the days, is a sex worker, you know. Uh, because oh, man. People, I've always you know. said, uh, for a number of reasons, which, uh, uh, well, I, said, uh, I won't elaborate. Uh, maybe one day mm -hmm. when I, when my books start coming out, I write a lot of these stories. Mm -hmm. For a number of reasons growing up, I've always mm -hmm. sat down and said, the people that go overseas, that people think and expect mm -hmm. and, and, and assume that they become more enlightened, by virtue of interacting with people from around the globe, the Nigerians that do that tend to be the worst human beings you can find in the world. I'm saying, I, I'm not saying everybody because I also live overseas, but I'm telling you, I would put it at like 75%. Yeah. That high. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I would say it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, um, okay, not that he lives overseas, but to return to Bayo Nanuga. So here is Bayo Nanuga saying, oh, Igbo people should not interfere in the affairs of Lagos, okay? Uh, and I'm sure that uh, two things. If, if people in the Niger Delta were to rise up tomorrow and say, okay, 100% of the resources that are from the Niger Delta should be retained by people in the Niger Delta because the Niger Delta is not, not a no man's land. Yep. Bayonanuga will write a treatise. <laughs> showing how that is wrong because he needs access to that money right and without that money nigeria is bankrupt essentially but also to give a different example supposing tomorrow the british government or the american government says if you are a nigerian born citizen and you became a naturalized american or naturalized Brit british you're not to vote because you are interfering in, um, you know, British elections or British affairs. Britain is not everybody's land. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, mm -hmm. but there are some people who own Britain. I'm sure that somebody like Baron Nanuga is going to, you know, fly into a fury and recognize the injustice and the absolute absurdity of that, uh, you know, prescription. Okay. But... He is writing these things about Igbo people should not interfere. And I wonder when he was saying it. So, because what he's saying in, his, in, in a way is that Igbo people should not vote against uh, anybody, um, they, they, uh, anybody that Bayonanuga likes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but 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 Bayo Nanuga, the same Bayo Nanuga, if every Igbo person in Lagos organized and said, we're going to vote for Tinubu, he's not going to say to them, no, you should not interfere, right? <laughs> Go and sit down, we don't need your votes. So, so, so oh. it's that, the whole contradiction. I mean, there are so many levels of contradictions of, of, um, of paradoxes in, yeah. in what he said, you know, but but he doesn't. I think appear, I have some know. advice that I'll, I'll, I should write a pamphlet for some of these guys. Chapter one: mm. When you wake up in the morning, look at the mirror and ask yourself, "Am I an idiot?" Yeah, that's, that's chapter one. <laughs> Actually, and so, and, am I an and idiot? <laughs> if if you tell yourself I'm an idiot, <laughs> then do yourself a favor: write nothing that will go out to the public. Yeah, pretty. And much. if you tell yourself, "No, I'm not an idiot." then um, refrain from writing something <laughs> without having at least 
10 friends that you respect looking at it to ensure that it it, it holds up you know because imagine, yeah imagine it's it's <laughs> I, I might, imagine all the people that call this man this kind of people friends you don't friends brothers you don't even... and I, I i can tell you that a lot of his friends must be ashamed of him a lot of his friends must be ashamed of him and and by the way you know again some Igbo people unfortunately fall into the trap of seeing this thing as an Igbo Yoruba thing. I absolutely it is not an Igbo Yoruba thing. Precisely because, and there are lots of Yoruba people idiots. who say, who, yeah, precisely. So it's some, Stupid, uh, some Yoruba idiots, idiots and some Igbo idiots as well. Yeah, okay? well, they're just so, idiots. So, so there were they're, people they're not, who They're not Igbo they're, idiots they're, or Yoruba they're, idiots. They're just, they're just idiots. idiots. Precisely, precisely. <laughs> because there, there were Yoruba uh, men and women who wrote and said, you don't speak for me. You don't speak oh. for me. And it is important that we underscore, you know, so a, a friend of mine was going to uh, do a debate, you know, about this whole Igbo and Yoruba thing in relation to the politics of Lagos. And I said to him, you have to be careful. Don't be led into this trap. Mm -hmm. It is not Igbo people against Tinubu. It is, it is well-meaning Nigerians, youth from different parts of the country, from different ethnic, et, et, ethnicities, in a sense, a majority of them Yoruba. Who a lot, say a lot of uh, people that led this far as Fabi uh, Fanlon also, and these are all pure yeah. Yoruba boys. Precisely. Mr. Macron, that is a really funny skit maker mm -hmm. and comedian. Mm -hmm. These are all, and people from mm -hmm. all sides, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of people, it's. Mm -hmm. To even yeah. to me to even reduce it to start mm -hmm. calling people yeah. like, this, like this Yoruba person, yeah. this Yoruba yeah. person, it's yeah. even ridiculous you know, to me. It is. It is. People ridiculous. woke up. People are, are tired. Um, a lot of these people, and in my humble opinion, like they, they, at the very minimum, Nigeria needs to again. I keep saying it restructured, and part mm -hmm. of that restructuring is all these resources. People, if it's on your land. It should be yours. You can have a federal tax structure mm -hmm. to tax them in case you want to make a strong center, which I didn't mm -hmm. even propose. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not me. But mm -hmm. all these people who, what's my train? Anyway, all, all these people who just, I've even lost the train of, it's so, so infuriating. Anyway, so, anyway, I think I lost that train of thought. Well, <laughs> well, well yeah. so, um, not is an issue that uh, we can get into in today's episode because we've um, we've actually had um quite yeah, a no. bit of yeah. yeah um but um it's interesting to watch how the legal case that will be especially but also Atiku but I think that Art even Atiku's camp knows that Peter will be won the election and that he has a, a stronger case uh establishing Atiku, if fraud. Atiku wants to wants to lift up his image to a large degree. That would be mm -hmm. the move to make. Just admit it. Mm -hmm. right, look, man, Obi-Wan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I will support yeah. him. Yeah. And, yeah. But I don't yeah. think he'll do it. No, anymore. I don't, uh, I don't think uh, he's going to uh, do it. My chance to help. I, I don't think he's going to do it. Um, but so they, especially with the reports of the chief justice of the country, uh, going abroad and possibly meeting with Tinubu and so on. There are all kinds of uh, things that are, are are going on. You saw, you saw what they did. So mm -hmm. people saw him mm -hmm. go to London. Tinubu was in Paris. Mm -hmm. He comes back on Friday before Juma tells. Yes, yes. I go to Yeah, you and, know. And the question then is, okay, yes. if you didn't meet, why don't you guys bring yes. out a statement and say you, yes. you were in Lagos, yes. you were sitting there, or you were in Abuja, yes. you mm -hmm. didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah, you haven't done that, have you? No, you haven't. <laughs> and 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 you know, um, uh, People's Gazette uh, is standing by the, by the story that they did meet. Mm -hmm. um, and you see, the good fact, thing people now, that, people that were part of that story said that the reason they're not going to release details now is because they will expose mm -hmm. the, their sources. Their sources, yes. People yes. are the, the people that bullseye the. They haven't missed in anything they've reported. Yes. I've mm -hmm. said the same thing. So I, 
it's a 100 percent um and you know the picture was there Which, the itinerary is there yeah and if Which, you, have, you have a public relations person mm-hmm, both as the mm-hmm. supreme court and the chief justice it doesn't take, it take anything to be like uh you draft a um a um statement, a statement. And they, they will do it for you and put mm-hmm. it out there while I was Absolutely. in the office. Say it now. They yes. dare you say it. Yes. yes. Say it you're not there. So, so, and that's, you know, that's the thing. That's, that I think, the predicament that a Tinubu faces, okay, that is up against young people. And these young people have means of communications and technological means of surveillance, of movements, and of movements of persons and of capital and so on that these old geriatric politicians have no clue about um and so i think that going forward these young men who have been young men and women who have been disenfranchised uh, are going to come out with just devastating information about what has happened in the country, what happened with the elections, uh, what's happening with the judiciary. And so I think a lot of people are going to sit up, and especially in a case where the international community is particularly attentive to uh, events going on in the country. Yes, you can take all the money that you want if you're a judge uh, in order to give the wrong verdict, uh, but you're going to pay for it. You know, young people are going to monitor your movements. You're not going to move freely in the world. Um, and nor is it likely that your family members are going to be able to move freely in the world to enjoy that money, which is the fruit of your uh, corrupt um, action as an electoral of- official or your actions as a judicial. Yeah. Um, well, one thing officer. I wanted to get into later, but not, not in this episode, it's just... It's we're talking about it right before. I'm like, look, man, Nigeria is like a underdeveloped human being, right? Mm-hmm. You're looking at this human being, and it looks like a child, mm-hmm. but apparently it's a it's a man. It's a fully grown human being, and then you're like, oh, sorry, you start talking to the human being, and you know this, you know, no offense to them, like you know, the, uh, <laughs> maybe the, what are they call them dwarfs or whatever they're supposed mm-hmm. to be called, right? Mm-hmm. And then you. Yeah, you start talking to the human being. Hey, how you doing? And you, you expect, oh, the, this this person should have like a, a, a matured voice, like yeah, you know. But instead, the person starts talking like a child. Hey, yeah, that, that, that's nice. Nigeria is like it. It looks like a child, but you know, it's an adult. And then you talk to it, and it talks like an absolute baby, right? So it's like you're looking at this very malformed um, 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 country, and I, and I, I I bring that up to say. Um, essentially, it's like the question of 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 knowledge, knowledge of of um, to use if, if it was law, you'd say men's rare knowledge of the crime. But it's like just knowledge of right and evil, of wrong. From what you were saying, like because mm-hmm. there's always this this philosophical debate about whether there's actual free will. And, you know, mm-hmm. second, but with Nigeria, it's just a question that you're looking at a country where. Uh, is, is is this is there uh, these people have been indoctrinated and educated in a way i always talk about right from pre um during colonialism and pre-independence and it's continued so on and so far and it's well documented actually it's like mm-hmm. give you a whole bunch of very well done academic work and people are still doing more showing mm-hmm. it. so it's like people that have been miseducated and it's, it's like what what do we do with this is it that these people, you know, it's like these people don't understand anything. Are you going to educate them? Mm-hmm. And if and part of their education and their indoctrination is to be scared of people like, like, like you or us that want to be like, yo, think of it this way. Think of it that way. I'm saying all this because you're like saying, well, you know, this guy, this guy, you won't enjoy the money and all that. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't ring for all these people. Mm-hmm. Simply doesn't. It, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Like, how much money mm-hmm. does somebody can somebody give you that you can yeah. walk out and say your children are not human beings? Yeah, your children don't have their paternal uh, heritage. How much money? Like, I, I, I would love to know. 
Like, what's the number? I, I, out of curiosity, I just want to know what's the number because I'm sure, I'm sure it's not like a hundred million. Mm. I'm sure it's not ten million. I'm sure maybe it's at best a million bucks, dollars, right? Probably not even up to. But you can. So, does this person have a consciousness that they can, they are capable of understanding just how ridiculous mm-hmm. the situation they are in is? I'm are, just like when I said, I'm like, yeah, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> it's it's you know one of the. Um, and I, I mean, as a collective, do we have? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, one of the one of the uh, beautiful things, uh, sort of moral maturity that a human has, is when you recognize. Uh, when you real, realize something that should be so commonplace because it's so true that as the saying goes, in the end, none of us lives this world alive, okay? And when you live this world, it doesn't matter if you leave your children a $100 million, they could blow through it in a year or two and become wretched, okay? And if you get buried in a gold-plated coffin, guess what? You are still the same cadaver. You're not any better than a madman who dropped dead on the streets. Both of you, once you're dead, you're the same kind of, you know, really matter, right? But people struggle so much and, you know, they struggle to build this massive house a mansion, they call it, the, to buy what Nigerians call exotic cars and so on. And in the end, when they pass, they are mocked by all of this because, uh, A, even if you own 20 cars, you're not going to be buried with any of them. And even if your family went crazy and decided to dig a field of, of a grave and they buried you with 20 cars, they are of no use to you. They're just going to rust, you know? you know? And yet people do all these things to say, I'm wearing a wristwatch of $50,000, right? Guess what? At the end of the day, it tells you the time. And there are wristwatches of $10 that will tell the same time. That and I would, I would add to what you're well. saying, very quickly, I'll add to what you're saying is like, they would look at it and say, well, you live in the West and all these guys yes. do this. The difference between the people you see in these countries, whether it's even in communist countries, in, in Russia and other places, or America, is that these people that are having these kind of wealth or these things have created some level of value. Mm-hmm. They're creating nothing, man. Mm-hmm. They're Zero. creating nothing, yes. yes. Just going there to take this yeah, national yeah. kick. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, it's crazy. And I, I think that that's a great place to end today's episode. <laughs> yeah. Just with that categorical statement that part of the, it's a big part of the deformation of the Nigerian space is the fact that those with the greatest means, some of those who have the greatest means in the country, have created no value. In other words, what they have is ill gotten. Is illicit, and ultimately, it is wealth that mocks them. So, we thank you very much, uh, our fans and followers. And uh, please do keep in touch. We are back. We're going to be back in a big way because there's so much uh, that will be unpacked uh, in the coming weeks um, and months as the courts um, look at. Uh, what transpired uh, in the two elections in Nigeria. And hopefully, um, we expect, we hope, hopefully, hopefully, we hopefully hope that there will be some judges uh, with the moral spine, uh, with the principle, with uh, the strength to make the right calls and to restore a sense of hope and a sense of justice without which there is no nation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.